in 1971. The air was thick with anticipation as families prepared for the holiday. But at Portland International Airport, something far more sinister was about to unfold. Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 prepared for takeoff from Portland, Oregon. The aircraft, a Boeing 727, was bustling with activity as passengers settled into their seats, unaware of the extraordinary events that would soon transpire. The destination was Seattle, Washington. A short flight, just a hop over the state line, but it would become one of the most infamous flights in aviation history. On board were 36 passengers and a crew of six. The atmosphere was typical for a holiday flight, filled with the hum of conversation and the rustle of newspapers. Among them was a man who would soon become the subject of one of the most enduring mysteries in American history. He was an unassuming figure, blending in seamlessly with the other travelers. He called himself Dan Cooper. Little did anyone know, this name would soon be etched into the annals of criminal folklore. Cooper was a nondescript man. He had no distinguishing features that would make him stand out in a crowd, which made his actions all the more shocking. He wore a dark suit, a white shirt, and a black tie. His attire was as unremarkable as his demeanor, yet it would soon become iconic. He ordered a bourbon and soda and chain-smoked cigarettes. His calm and collected manner gave no hint of the chaos he was about to unleash. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper passed a note to a flight attendant. At first, she thought it was just another passenger flirting with her. The note claimed he had a bomb. It was a simple, chilling message that would change the course of the flight. He demanded $200,000 in cash and four parachutes. His demands were precise, leaving no room for negotiation. The pilot, William Scott, contacted air traffic control. His voice was steady, but the gravity of the situation was clear. The airline and the FBI quickly agreed to Cooper's demands. They had no choice but to comply, hoping to avoid any harm to the passengers and crew. The plane circled over Seattle while the authorities gathered the ransom money. Each minute felt like an eternity as the tension mounted. The passengers remained unaware of the drama unfolding around them. They continued their conversations, blissfully ignorant of the hijacking in progress. Cooper remained calm and collected throughout the ordeal. His demeanor was almost unnervingly serene, as if he had rehearsed this scenario countless times in his mind. Despite the tension in the cabin, he exuded an air of confidence that was hard to ignore. Some witnesses even described him as polite and well-spoken. He addressed the flight attendants with respect, never raising his voice or showing any signs of aggression. His calm and courteous behavior stood in stark contrast to the gravity of the situation. He spoke in a measured tone and seemed to know his way around airplanes. His knowledge of aviation was evident as he discussed technical details with the crew. It was clear that he had done his homework and was well prepared for this moment. He specified the type of parachutes he wanted. This wasn't a random demand. He knew exactly what he needed to make his escape. The specificity of his request suggested a level of expertise that was both impressive and alarming. This detail suggested a level of familiarity with skydiving. It wasn't just about having the right equipment, it was about knowing how to use it. Cooper's calm demeanor and precise demands painted a picture of a man who was in complete control. I need two front and two back parachutes. His voice was steady, leaving no room for negotiation. The crew had no choice but to comply with his demands, hoping that cooperation would ensure their safety. The FBI assembled the ransom money. They worked quickly, knowing that time was of the essence. Every second counted, and they couldn't afford any mistakes. They used unmarked $20 bills. The money was carefully prepared, each bill meticulously checked to ensure it was untraceable. This was a standard procedure in hostage situations, aimed at preventing any immediate tracking. They also recorded the serial numbers of each bill. This was a crucial step, providing a potential lead for tracking Cooper down later. The agents knew that every detail mattered in this high-stakes game. The hope was this would help track Cooper down later. They were playing a long game, understanding that capturing Cooper might take time and patience. Every piece of evidence was a potential clue. After hours of circling, the plane finally landed at Seattle-Tacoma Airport. The tension in the cabin was palpable as the passengers braced for what would come next. Cooper's calmness was a stark contrast to the anxiety felt by everyone else on board. Cooper released the 36 passengers and two flight attendants. This act of mercy was unexpected, but it provided a glimmer of hope. 
The relieved passengers quickly disembarked, grateful to be free from the ordeal. He kept the pilot, co-pilot and flight engineer on board. These were the individuals he needed to execute the next phase of his plan. Their expertise was crucial for what he had in mind. Cooper instructed them to fly to Mexico City. His plan was unfolding with precision, each step carefully calculated. The crew had no choice but to follow his orders, hoping that compliance would ensure their safety. He was very calm, almost reassuring. His demeanor was so composed that it was almost unsettling. It was as if he had done this a hundred times before. It's like he knew exactly what he was doing. There was no hesitation in his actions, no second guessing. Every move he made was deliberate and confident. He didn't seem nervous at all. His calmness was infectious, almost making the crew believe that everything would be all right. It was like he had done this before. His confidence suggested experience, making everyone wonder about his true identity and past exploits. The Boeing 727 took off again. This time, it flew at a low altitude and at a slow speed. This was at Cooper's request to facilitate his escape. Cooper had also instructed the crew to keep the cabin unpressurized. Somewhere between Seattle and Reno, Nevada, Cooper made his move. He lowered the rear stairs of the aircraft. With the ransom money strapped to his body, he jumped into the night sky. He vanished into the darkness and the pouring rain. That was the last anyone ever saw of D.B. Cooper. The plane, with its remaining crew, landed safely in Reno. The FBI launched a massive manhunt. It spanned multiple states and involved hundreds of agents. But despite their efforts, Cooper had disappeared without a trace. The FBI investigation into the D.B. Cooper case was extensive, spanning several years and involving numerous agents. They interviewed hundreds of people and followed thousands of leads, hoping to uncover any clue that could point them in the right direction. But despite their best efforts, the trail remained cold, as if Cooper had simply vanished without a trace. The only physical evidence Cooper left behind was a black tie, a few cigarette butts, and the rear air stair of the plane, which he used to make his daring escape. We had a lot of leads, but none of them panned out. Each promising tip turned into a dead end, adding to our frustration. It was like he vanished into thin air, leaving us with more questions than answers. The lack of concrete evidence gave rise to a plethora of theories, each more intriguing than the last. Some people believed Cooper was an experienced skydiver, capable of executing such a high-risk jump with precision. Others thought he was an amateur who got lucky, managing to survive against all odds. And still, others speculated that he hadn't survived the jump at all, perishing somewhere in the vast wilderness. The mystery deepened with time as the years passed and no new evidence came to light. The FBI continued to receive tips and leads even decades after the hijacking, each one reigniting the hope of solving the case. None of them led to a definitive answer about Cooper's true identity or his fate, leaving the case shrouded in mystery and speculation. The legend of D.B. Cooper has become a part of American folklore, a tale of audacity and mystery that continues to captivate the public imagination. Even today, amateur sleuths and professional investigators alike are drawn to the enigma, each hoping to be the one to finally crack the case. The search for D.B. Cooper is far from over, as the quest for answers continues to inspire and intrigue. One of the most intriguing pieces of evidence in the D.B. Cooper case was the discovery of a portion of the ransom money. In 1980, a young boy named Brian Ingram was playing on the banks of the Columbia River, about nine years after the hijacking. He found a bundle of decaying $20 bills. The serial numbers on the bills matched those of the ransom money given to Cooper. The discovery sparked renewed interest in the case. However, it raised more questions than it answered. How did the money end up on the riverbank? Did Cooper survive the jump and stash it there? Or was it carried by the wind from the alleged jump location? Over the years, the FBI investigated over 800 suspects in connection with the D.B. Cooper case. Some of these individuals were ruled out through DNA testing, while others remain persons of interest. One of the most well-known suspects was Richard McCoy. McCoy was a Vietnam War veteran and a skilled skydiver. He pulled off a similar hijacking just a few months after Cooper's. He was eventually caught and imprisoned but died in a shootout with the FBI in 1974. Another prominent suspect was Dwayne Weber. On his deathbed in 1995, Weber confessed to his wife that he was D.B. Cooper. 
He even provided details about the hijacking that were not publicly known. However, the FBI was unable to definitively link Weber to the crime. Section 7. The Norjack Theory Was D.B. Cooper a Boeing employee? One compelling theory is the Norjack Theory. This theory suggests that D.B. Cooper was a Boeing employee with intimate knowledge of the Boeing 727 aircraft. The name Norjack comes from the code word used by Northwest Orient Airlines for hijackings. Proponents of this theory point to Cooper's detailed knowledge of the 727 systems. He requested a specific type of parachute and knew about the rear air stair, which was not commonly used by passengers. Could this suggest an insider job? Section 8. Beyond Reasonable Doubt. The case remains cold. Despite the intriguing leads and theories, the FBI officially suspended its active investigation into the D.B. Cooper case in 2016. After 45 years and countless man-hours, the mystery remained unsolved. The statute of limitations on the air piracy charge expired in 1976. This means that even if Cooper were to be identified and apprehended, he could no longer be prosecuted for the hijacking itself. The lack of a conclusion has only served to further fuel public fascination with the case. Section 9. D.B. Cooper in the public imagination. A cultural phenomenon, the D.B. Cooper case has captured the public imagination for decades. It has been the subject of countless books, documentaries, and even a Hollywood movie. The mystery of his disappearance, combined with the audacity of his crime, has turned D.B. Cooper into a folk hero of sorts. People are drawn to the story for various reasons. Some are intrigued by the puzzle of his identity and the possibility that he got away with it. Others are captivated by the daring nature of the crime itself. Section 10. The Enduring Mystery. D.B. Cooper's Legacy. The D.B. Cooper case remains one of the most enduring mysteries of the 20th century. It is a testament to the enduring power of the unknown. The case serves as a reminder that even in an age of advanced technology and surveillance, some secrets refuse to be revealed. Whether D.B. Cooper was a master criminal, a lucky amateur, or simply met an untimely end, his story continues to fascinate and inspire. The legend of D.B. Cooper lives on, a testament to the enduring allure of the unsolved.